Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Rowe, Big Jim and Gertie are with me as usual. We're going to have a look back at all the Premiership action from the weekend. The lads are going to analyse Warren Gatlin's British and Irish Lions squad. Plus, we're going to have a chat to one man who was a bit of a surprise pick to many, but not the experts on this show, of course. Gloucester, Scotland and now British and Irish Lions centre Chris Harris is joining us. Yeah! So turn up the volume, shut out the noise, subscribe to Spotify and enjoy the show. How's your week been, lads? Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot. Um, a big day today, from what I'm hearing. Producer Tim gave us some news just before we came live on air that the world's opening back up. If you're in England, if your world is in England. So, Andrew, that's good, isn't it? That means that we can maybe see each other again properly. We didn't see each other this Friday, did we? I was meant to come down this Friday. And then because I went out for a few beers with John Barkley a couple of days before and we sat outside and we were freezing. There was no music. There was no vibe. I thought I ain't wasting a green card coming down to see Goody for work, work and sitting outside in the pishing doing lean, although I wouldn't flinch if it was getting rained on. And <laughs> I ain't wait. I ain't wasting the green card on that, Andrew, but I think it's only back up. Yeah. I think the bigger issue for you was your camel toe leather brown jacket wouldn't have been acceptable down in London. And you're looking for a new jacket, aren't you? Arguably, I mean, it was waterproof 10 years ago. It probably isn't now, but it's got nothing to do with, <laughs> with a camel toe jacket. It's got to do with me not wasting a day or it probably take a week and a day. It takes me a week to recover now if I've got a hangover. Um, but yeah, just just quiet. It's, um, it's the calm before the storm, lads, isn't it? <laughs> it's the calm before the storm. Andrew, but I did see on your social media that you went to hell on earth at the weekend. Well, this is, your, this is what I'm holding. I'm not happy with you, Jim, to be honest, because we'd arranged for some work on Friday um, and I'd obviously cleared it with the uh, the gaffer in the house, which is myself. I've just said, um, that's what I'm doing, so deal with it. Slash said, Carolyn, please might go uh, out with Jim for a few beers socially. We've got some work to talk about. And she's like, yeah, of course you can, on Friday. So Jim cancels on me. I tell the missus, I was like, oh, yeah, we're not. I'm not meeting Jim now on Friday. So... Um, free to do anything she's like right let's go to legoland oh my legoland is what i'm saying the kids absolutely, yeah mate the kids absolutely loved it i'm on crutches i've done seven thousand steps on crutches still and i am absolutely hanging out my ass i thought about you jim every ride i'm going on my knees around my ears because i'm too big for the rides too wide too tall and i'm thinking imagine jim being here with his four kids screaming so one of those things would have been Actually, it could be worse because I could have four kids screaming instead I've just got the twins who are loving it, sprinting off everywhere. Let's go to the next one, Daddy. I'm like, I can't run. Look at me, I'm on crutches. I'm sweating because I'm on crutches trying to walk 7,000 steps that I can't do anymore because I'm my ankle's still absolutely knackered. And all I'm thinking is I'm raging with Jim because we were supposed to be meeting on Friday for a few socially distanced beers. Actually, I'd have just given you a hug on Friday if I'd have seen you, which we can do from next Friday. And now... I'm absolutely slippered from going to Lego London Friday. It took me a couple of days to recover. It gets worse though. Saturday we had a chilled day, took the kids swimming, a few jobs around the house and took the kids out to play. What do you mean jobs around the house? Just kind of go into a bit more detail to, around that. Yeah, what? well, I just had to go to the tip and drop some stuff off. So kids in the back, pull up at the tip. The bloke's like, what you got? I said, mate, I've got loads of cardboard and two screaming kids. I want to keep the cardboard, but bin the kids off. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse. Sunday we've gone to... The farm, there's a farm there us called Odds Farm Park, which is really good, actually. Um, there's loads of stuff for the kids to play on, a big sand pit, loads of climbing frames and slides and all this stuff. The kids absolutely... Hell on earth. Hell on earth. Until, until about halfway through the day, and the missus has gone, right, uh, I'm just going to go and get some ice cream. Do you want an ice cream? I'm like, fucking too right, I do. Get me a super-sized strawberry as big as you can carry. And so off she goes. I'm in the sand pit with the twins. I'm playing with Isabella. Olivia's around the corner somewhere. All I hear is a piercing scream. And you know when you recognise your own kid's scream? You hear other kids scream, you're like, that's not my kid, I don't care. When you hear your own kid scream, I'm like, oh my God, where's the nanny? Was my first thought. I'm like, where is she? I'm like, it's the weekend. So she goes, I'm like, where's Pablo? I had to furlough Pablo, send him back. He's back in soon. He's back in soon. (laughs) So basically, it's just me and Olivia comes running over to me. She's been stung in the chin by a honeybee and the reason I know it's a honeybee because the stinger was still in there if it was a wasp 
wasps just go in and out and fuck off, don't they? they you are such them. you are such a bee wasp expert to say that. I know, I know, but she's screaming her head off. The missus is off getting ice cream. It takes her half an hour to get back. I'm like, are you taking the piss, love? How long does it take to get an ice cream? <laughs> it's because it's bloody leg. No, it's, it's, it's the farm, wasn't it? Sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, she she took half an hour to get back. Olivia just screaming her head off. Every parent's looking at me because my kid's screaming, and I'm I, I'm like, what do I do? Dive into the bag, see if there's any cream to help it soothe I'm like what do you put on it i'm like don't worry mommy will be back in a minute with ice cream you can stick the ice cream on it and lick it as well nothing took half an hour so uh yeah it was a family weekend of fun and then screaming um but what did make me feel better as i said to the missus it could be worse we could be like jim before and she's like no chance so uh, i blame you jim and i also feel your pain sometimes a couple of other things, Andrew, before we get moving on this. We know it was a big week last week, and I'm sure Andy Rowe will allude to that soon. But firstly, from my point of view, I've got an apology to make. For the millions of you that were going to come out to watch myself and Andy Rowe and gorgeous Chris do the eating mess on Saturday, I'm out, lads. I'm out of the try. I'm out, I'm out of the try for long. What's yeah, happened? Paul, Paul DeCalf. You know what's happened, Andy Rowe, because oh, you've been mate. questioning me. All that, Paul DeCalf. You've pulled your calf. I, I know. I'm you ain't got any you. fucking calves to pull, Sam. What are you talking I about? I'm surprised at this year. <laughs> I've seen more muscle on a fucking chicken's legs than your calves. What are you talking about? Well, guilty as charged. If one of them's been pulled, that's all I know. It might it might be broke. I don't know. If, there, if it isn't the muscle, it's a broken leg. Because I ain't running, is all I'm saying. So apologies for the millions of you that were coming out to watch the eating mess at the weekend. That's one thing. And the other thing is a congratulations, Andrew. You... Oh. Are going to be back at work soon, aren't you? They're opening things back up, but I'm worried because you're high. Are you still classed as high risk or not? Or are you getting back to work? <laughs> Big Boris has announced we can have cuddles. I don't know what else you can do, but people are going back to work. High risk, Andrew. Are you going back to work, mate? I'm. I'm. I probably classified as high risk, and it's you know we, we joke on here, and we mess around, but my brother had his uh, vaccination and he he got some uh, blood clots on his lungs a few weeks after, so. My old man's got a few heart difficulties that he's had for many years. I'm, I'm, I end up forgetting on the tube again, boys and girls. Not yet, anyway. Not until I've had the double jab and the AstraZeneca one. Apparently, um, can cause blood clots. So I'm, I, I classify myself as high risk. So uh, you are yeah, definitely. People... I can tell you now, just even looking at you, you don't need to go into any detail. You are high risk. If you're working listening, <laughs> I've got visuals on you, and as you are looking better, but you need to be very careful. But my good self. I'm leaving the house. I'm, <laughs> I'm out. I can't do this any longer. So we're waiting for the holiday list of, I don't know why they call it, what they call them, corridor, travel corridors to open. Well, they um, came out on Friday. Yeah. And basically you can go to the Falklands or New Zealand where <laughs> New Zealand won't let us in, so we can't fucking go on holiday. <laughs> Falklands it is. <laughs> <laughs> you guys uh, had a... Watched the uh, the British and Irish Lions squad live uh, on Thursday, but you've had a few days now to digest it. What do you make of it overall? Ow, ow in the know is my good self. A lot of people, and I was worried, lads. I've lost a lot of credibility in the last year. A lot what? of credit. Yeah, I know. I'm as surprised as you. <laughs> Mainly <laughs> about Alan Wynne Jones. Mainly about Alan Wynne Jones and a couple of other people, and only Wales naming one well. Welshman in. Yeah, yeah Wales. He's, he's, uh, I named Nick Tompkins a year ago. I named Nick Tompkins in the Lions squad as the only Welshman. But when the squad got announced, I've peeled back very smellily a lot of credibility. <laughs> I've, I've peeled back a lot of credibility, I think, because I picked all the Scots to go, apart from Rory Sutherland, because I thought he was injured. Stevie Ferris gave us some insight that he spoke to his agent and said he was fit. And... You know, I, I, I was literally on the cusp of probably not doing the podcast ever again because I'd have to hide my face in shame. But lads, absolutely nailed it. I don't know where you want to go, Andy Rowe. There were some big calls in there. Well, we can maybe go with the forwards, Andrew, and you can put me right if I go wrong. But a talking point from the weekend is the one around Carl Sinclair not going. For me, I, I had Xander Ferguson, I had Andrew Porter and Tug Furlong all day long. And me, it wasn't even a question. So I'm sure we can get on to the Carl Sinclair interaction after his performance for Bristol's at the weekend. Second row, I changed from James Ryan to Ian Henderson, lastminute.com. So I picked Ian Henderson to go. On reflection, 
Johnny Gray should be going, in my opinion. Instead of Johnny, Johnny Hill, I don't know if you've had his cider, it is disgusting. <laughs> this rib, rib tickler, we've asked him to come on, it's disgusting. He ain't coming on, he's boycotted us. The rib tickler stinks. It doesn't really, it's actually really nice. <laughs> but arguably, you could say that Johnny Gray should go ahead of Johnny Hill. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case, but I'm just looking at the makeup of what he's done in, in, in the second row in the back row, that we you could have put a Johnny Gray in there. But on the whole, when you look at it, He's made some big, big calls, right? And he's picked guys that played in the Six Nations, right? I know Xander was red-carded. And he's picked people that are on form. And he's yeah. picked Sam Simmons. Goody, Goody was chomping at the bit to get Sam Simmons. Everyone was talking about it. And that's a ballsy call. So from a, from a forwards perspective, when you look at the makeup of the squad, the players on form, players that deserve to go, and players with the appetite to go. Like Joe Marler puts a tweet out like after saying that he was underwhelmed by the squad going out and he's obviously pissed off that he's not going. Mate, you don't deserve to go, right? You've not played in the Six Nations. You pulled yourself out of there for family reasons, completely get that. There can't be an expectation with you that now says, I want to go on a Lions tour. I should go on a Lions tour ahead of who. Not that he is saying that, but I had him in my squad and I think it's right that he doesn't go. And yeah. it's the right decision for me with the tight heads that he's picked. The hookers were never in doubt. You know, no one really stepped up. Um, to push Ken Owens, uh, Jamie George, and um, Luke Karen Dickey out, Luke Karen Dickey out the way, and um, yeah, I think there'll be some lads that will be naturally disappointed, but I think across the forwards, I'd say I'm pretty happy. James Ryan is obviously going to be devastated, right? But unfortunately for him, you know, the Six Nations didn't play that well, and then he got injured, and he had a big opportunity for Leinster. Ian Henderson's a test match animal. Gat Gatlin almost seems to have gone with what he knows. And Goody will chat about the backs. Elliot Daly, who would have thought? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, you look at it and, you, and you're mainly talking about the forwards, but you look back on the squad now and we all got romantic around who we think should go, who's on form, who plays, who's played really well in the Six Nations and all this stuff. But in reality, not many people thought about it from Gatlin's point of view. And that's all that matters. It's what I tried to say last week, but... Gatlin's idea of how they're going to beat South Africa, you know, you, you're, you're talking Johnny, compare Johnny Gray and Johnny Hill, right? To me, and I'm not saying Johnny Gray isn't physical, but I see Johnny Hill as more physical than Johnny Gray. Like, he'll go and try and belt someone. Admittedly, you know, he, sometimes he can get it wrong. I think it was the Leinster game when he caught someone high-ish. But Johnny Gray is a workhorse, but a lot of them are soak-up tackles. They're not massive ball carries where you've got someone like Johnny Hill who's an out and out athlete like he's a spring chicken at times isn't he he's sprinting around on a weird looking body because he's so big and it but he's physical he's athletic uh, and i think that's what was the difference in, in that selection um, on that point goody on on the johnny hill one is i've contradicted myself a little bit because i've said that he's picked on form and and what have you johnny hill is a line out caller right yeah um and he's massive like you said johnny gray arguably might be heavier but johnny hill the way that he's built calls the line outs Courtney Laws is another one in that kind of mould. And you can see with what he's done. I think with Johnny Gray, it must have been, cl it must have been close yeah. between, yeah. between, between not, them I'm, two. I'm, I'm not saying it wouldn't be. I'm saying it, it would have been close. But in Gatlin's mind, you look down the squad and then you go into the backs and you go, you know, we're going to chat with Chris Harris in a bit. Chris Harris, having played with him, he's a big lad. He's powerful. He goes and makes big hits. Bundyaki, no one saw Bundyaki come in at all, did they? Um, you know, I had when you write your list, you wrote down a list of all the players. I had four centers that I picked um, in my squad. And looking back on it, it was pretty stupid of me to pick these four centers. I went Ring Rose, Henry Slade, Jonathan Davis, and Robbie Henshaw. The only kind of muscular beast in that is Robbie Henshaw. Uh, it was romantically, I wanted to see Slade and, and Ring Rose play because I love the way they play rugby. but doesn't necessarily suit Gats's mould of player where they know they're going to have to be monstrously physical to beat South Africa because what's coming from South Africa, huge units. So you do need a balance of something different to beat South Africa, I think. Um, but thinking back on it, I had Owen Farrell down as a 10 slash 12 uh, as, as one of the three 10s. You're looking at Bundy Aki's selection, people are like, where's that come from? Well, Bundy Aki, when you watch him play, hard as fuck. His ball skills are ridiculous. At the game, I'm an offloading game. He goes and smashes people. Yes, he got sent off for, uh, against England 
um, for a, a tackle that was too high, his techniques, and there is that risk, but you're going to need physical athletes like that. Elliot Daly comes in at 13. You've got a small, smaller squad. You've got a 37 man squad. You're in a bubble. You need players that can cover different positions. Elliot Daly, hybrid kind of player, can play wing, fullback, centre. He's down as a centre, I think. Um, but we also know he's going to play on the wing, potentially, potentially fullback as well, if there are injuries. He's a guy that can, you know, withstand a load of games. He plays a hell of a lot of rugby. So you know he's durable. Um, and he's got his Howard sort of a left boot that could be, you know, at altitude. If you get to a test match, um, you know, let's not forget he kicked a monstrous penalty, I think, in the third test against New Zealand. South Africa, you're giving penalties around on your own 10 metre line. I'm telling you now, at altitude, I've played at altitude, I've kicked at altitude. Elliot Daly can bang him over from halfway between the 10 metre line and his own 22. If it becomes, no one necessarily wants to see. It just been a penalty fest, but that is a string in his bow that no one else has got. So we're, we're all romantically picking our squads of what we think, from our opinion, are players on form and playing well and who should go. But all that matters is Gats and his mindset of he wants big physical players in certain positions. Um, you know, you look at people talk about this the whole Carl Sinclair thing. Xander Fagerson, phenomenal in every facet of the game. Uh, I had Carl Sinclair down to be in the squad. But I hadn't necessarily thought about it. It was just that was maybe my mind saying, well, he went on the last lines tour, he's a good player, blah, blah, blah. But then, Jim, you convinced me. You were like, he's on the bench for John Arfawa for Bristol most of the time. Like, he's second choice there. He didn't really have a decent Six Nations. You know, so how are you picking him? Goody, you thought Jet Conan was in with the shot, but not many others did, did, you, did they? Yeah, I mean, I actually, when I named my squad, I changed it after Leinster lost to La Rochelle. Uh, I thought Conan had a quieter game. Um, and I, I flipped him out and flipped in Josh van der Flip at Fleer. I like uh, to see what you've done because he's got yeah. his flip. It's like a flip, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've disappointed myself that I did actually because thinking about it, Josh van der Fleer is a seven and you've got Tipper Slip, you've got Curry, you've got Hamish Watson, player of the Six Nations, etc. cetera. So why, why I swapped him out, I'll never know, but I did. Um and then you go back to his performance and just judge him on that performance against England in the Six Nations in the first half, especially. That's a top range player. Yeah, mate. Route he was one. out, he was he was hard, he was route one at times. He was out in the wide channels, his footwork, his speed, his offloading game. Mate, he is a proper athlete. And he's had a lot of unfortunate injuries along the way. So people perhaps are judging him more on the fact that he's been injured a bit as opposed to his actual rugby ability. But again, going to Warren Gap. Gats knows boys, doesn't he? Gats knows a player, knows a player's capability. He spoke about it in terms of the what he needs from back rowers, and that was yards after contact footwork. You know, if you go in Route One China the whole time, just slow and ploddy, but trying to barrel South Africa, you ain't going to win. So you need a difference. You need a bit of bulk, but you also need footwork and explosivity. And, and Cone's got that. And uh, yeah, you really said, pleased for him. You said that Gats knows that. <laughs> There's still question marks for me, just little ones, just little Go question on, marks. No, that's it. There's just yeah, just deep. What are the little it. question marks? What, what just the he, marks? yeah, that he doesn't get all the que- he doesn't get everything right, does he? Just just some things that he's not oh, fully. Last time, come on, Jim. What are your questions? No, it's not. It's not about just your me. Selection? No, it's not. It's not. He just doesn't get everything right. But um, yeah. he got the Sam Simmons one right, didn't he? My goodness me. Yes, he did. Big, yes, he did. What do you think, right? So when this is happening, because obviously Eddie Jones, it, he must be watching this unfold, right? He must be looking at it and thinking, which one of my boys are in there? And do you think it is like, excuse the French, fuck you, Freddie. Uh, sorry, excuse the French, fuck you, Eddie. Do you think <laughs> there's a part, do, do you think he feels that or not? It's like, because there's a lot of talk about Sam Simmons and there's been loads of talk, loads of talk. And it seems like there's either a personality issue or something, there's something that's not right because ev- not just you, not just me, not just everyone has spoken about how good Sam Simmons is. And we're thinking, well, are we getting a bit carried away? Like you said, Gats knows. And he's put his neck on the block and he's left some quality players out. You know, think of the players that he's left out, CJ Stander, yeah. you know, Billy Vanapola. Yeah. Um, Caleb old Doris, if he was back fit the way that he was playing before, to pick Sam Simmons, who's not played in the Six Nations, is a big call in the sense of saying to Eddie Jones, ha, yeah, 
Well, it's one, it's one of them. I don't think that Warren Gatlin's picked a player to go half to Eddie Jones, but I also know that there's there isn't much love lost between Eddie Jones and Warren Gatlin. You know, go up to the 2019 World Cup when they were having a little pop at each other, when Gat said that England had played their cup final while beating New Zealand. Eddie Jones comes back with good luck in the third, fourth place playoff. Gats was right. We played our cup final against New Zealand in the semi-final. Um, so Gats knows. Uh, but yeah, I, listen, again, certain players suit certain environments, don't they? Um, and certain visions of coaches. So Eddie Jones has gone down the line of, nah, he's not big enough for him. You know, even though every time Sam Simmons plays, he makes yard after yard after yard, scores tries. He's equaled the premiership try scoring record uh, for the forward with the most tries so far. He's going to break the record. Hopefully he's got four games left to break the overall record. And he needs two more tries to break that in the premiership for top try scorer. But again, Eddie Jones uh, has got his mindset on how he wants England to play and how he thinks England can dominate. And it hasn't worked in the Six Nations. And in doing that, He's picked Billy Vanapola. He's picked his players that were that got into a World Cup final in 2019, which is nearly two years ago. So it's, it, I think Eddie's looking at it going, if you asked him, he'd be like, now, nah, mate, not bothered, mate. Mate, I'm only concerned about England against USA in the summer, mate, where I'm going to pick everyone that everyone wants me to pick, but I can't pick them because, you know, if they don't fit Eddie's way, I'm going to phone Fairs and see if he wants to play on tour in England and in South Africa. But you sat there going, look at all the players now that have got to play for England this summer um, because other boys are aware of the Lions. Um, you know, you look at Marcus Smith, he hasn't picked him. Weldy. Dan Robson, hardly picked him. Phenomenal at the weekend. Um, you know, you expect him to be first choice. Maybe, or maybe he's just going to stick with Ben Youngs, even though, you know, Ben Youngs has pulled himself out of the England trip. So, sorry, even though Ben Youngs has pulled himself out of the Lions tour. So, yeah, I mean, is Eddie Jones watching it going, fuck you, Warren Gatland? Um, or is Warren Gatland going back to Eddie Jones and saying, fuck you, Eddie Jones, this is who I'm picking. I don't know, but it's funny, isn't it? It's funny that for everyone that's been saying you've got to pick Sam Simmons for England, that he gets the ultimate accolade of being picked for the British and Irish Lions. So I'm, I'm really pleased with Sam. Well, we can have a chat now with a man whose name was read out on Thursday and who's looking forward to going on his first British and Irish Lions tour. Gloucester and Scotland Centre, Chris Harris, joins us. How are you, mate? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. How are you? We're very good. We're very good. Mate, I just need to rewind to Thursday because there's so much build up. Um, you know, from the outside, Jim and myself, we're trying to put ourselves in the position of players now. Firstly, did you have an inkling that you were in the mix? Did you get that email or that letter that was originally there? And then secondly, just talk us through the emotion because we saw the video of uh, the announcement with all the Gloucester boys and how much carnage it was in there. They must have been so chuffed for you, obviously, but your personal feelings? So going, going back, so I had, I had the email to say, oh, you're in contention. Because um, there's, there's a load of stuff going on in the media about how Chris Harris lines this, lines that. And I was just sort of trying to like ignore it because I didn't really want to sort of think about it, to be honest. Um, and then I got that email, which was two weeks before the announcement, I think it was. And I was just like, oh, shit, this... <laughs> Oh, there's, there's a chance. Um, you're saying there's a chance. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> um, so then, but like, even still, then I was like, I didn't want to sort of put, like think that it was going to happen to sort of if it didn't happen, then I'd fall off this cliff. So like, I was just sort of tried to sort of bat it off. Even boys were like nudging me, being like, "Do you get the email? Do you get the email?" And I was just like, "Oh no, 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 no," just because didn't I didn't want any of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So like, in terms of being in the squad, like I had no idea. And honestly, as the names were coming up, it went Bundyaki. Can't remember who now. And it's, when it got to daily, I was like, right, there's two centre, there's two centre options. So I was just like, oh well, maybe not. And then as 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 Chris Harris came, it's like it was like Chris hurt, and then all the boys were like, oh, like on me. So I just didn't really have. Honestly, I was just in shock, like absolute shock. That was my initial feeling. And then obviously my phone was blowing up, and um, I think I, I called I called my girlfriend straight up, and she was just looking at me like, Charis, what, what the fuck. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, I feel exactly the same. I, I, honestly, I was in utter shock, and um, it probably took a couple of days just to like sink in. And I was just like, honestly, like, it's such an amazing feeling. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps listening to it. We, we've spoken about, we were chatting about it before in terms of being the pinnacle. And I think that anyone who questions um, is there a place for the Lions just need to look at the build up from last week and look at the reactions of players. I mean, it's one of them. Chris, you obviously play in the Six Nations. There was a couple of massive wins for us against England and obviously France. 
and people are still saying, oh, well, Scotland finished fourth, and they're trying to look at it. It was the, the away performances that had obviously secured it. Warren Gatlin speaks about players that can uh, perform away from home. So at the end of the Six Nations, when it's all said and done, it obviously turns to then the opportunity to go on the British and Irish Lions tour and get the opportunity. Was there any part of you in the lead-up to that thinking, you know, you might have done enough? Because I know there's a humility around it, right? But you're going to be looking at players in your position. You're going to be looking at your form, how you played in that game against France, which was exceptional. In the lead-up to it, like, how is it? Because you look at the disappointment and obviously, you know, we've all seen Carl Sinclair's interview at the weekend after the game and, the you know, the disappointment is real. You're in that room with the lads and, you know, you're thinking there is a chance, but you're not too sure whether you're going to go, you know, Mara told you we know, Owen Farrell's definitely going to go, Conor Murray, these names. Again, just like, how is that? Is it like the best day of your life? Is that how it feels? That's, that's def- definitely is the best. But like, as I say, like, it was more... Like it was the best day of my life was probably a couple of days after when I've like allowed it to all sink in and reflect on it. Because at the time I was just like mind blown. It was just like, what on earth? Um, so like once it all sunk in and I was like, wow, we like this is this is properly special, isn't it? Like, like I could I didn't even imagine like during the Six Nations, like it was it wasn't like I wasn't even thinking about that. Because I I've never I've never like it's cliche hours, but I never think more than like a week or two ahead. Like I just keep myself focused in that in that way and that's how I get the best out of myself um so like I was it was just that's why I was so mind-blown just because I wasn't expecting it at all um but obviously now like it's like seeing boys like like Carl Sinclair's reaction how much it means to them and how devastated they are like it just it really just, just makes you you think even harder and you look at the boys that haven't even been selected and you're like wow like what an, what an absolute honor yeah, mate, it'd be amazing. Um, let's uh, hear about how did you celebrate the day? You obviously found out, out the news with your teammates and then uh, you had to go out and train again, did you? How are you training after being announced as a British Lion? And Surely you know, you're saying, Chaz, that uh, keep me I don't want to go out. I'm on the what bike now from literally <laughs> to the day I get on the plane. Oh, oh mate. Yeah, it was, like, as I said, it was such a weird one. I was out for a week with my shoulders anyway, so I didn't actually have to do the training. I just had like a running session, just a bit of fitness. Um, and when it was announced, I was out. So I was on the phone to a couple of people, and then Skivs came running out, and he's like, "He's like, oh mate, congratulations, mate!" Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> like I was like, oh, "Cheers, Skivs!" I was like, I, "I don't even know what to think." And he was like, "Mate, enjoy it. Take your time. Don't don't rush to get to training. We'll we'll see you when you get there." And I was like, "Oh, spawn." So I just potted about for a bit, and just sort of yeah, just got that shock out of the way. And, Went down and all, obviously all the boys just congratulating me and stuff like that. So like it was, yeah, it was bizarre, man. But I just got I got on with the running and did the running, yeah. And then went I went when I got home, went out for a meal with the missus and had a couple of drinks. But it was just, yeah, I'm still a bit shocked now to be honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, mate, funny. I I think it's class. You know, it's raw. You can see it, you can hear it, and you know the romance uh, is there around the lines. But I'm absolutely pumped for you. I've I've been. Mm-hmm back in your corner, having watched the way that you've played. And I think there's a part of it as well, not just the way that, you know, Scotland have played and yourself have played defensively and the task that's going to be ahead with South Africa. But I think having a couple of the Scotland coaches in the mixer now with Gregor Townsend and obviously Steve Tandy, who's running the defence for Scotland, did they chat to you about anything? I mean, Warren Gatland, has he said anything to you or not? Or was it, no, is it just no, no yeah. head down? No, but I didn't hear a word. Um, and then obviously after the announcement, I just I, I got a message off off Gregor and Steve just saying, "Oh, congratulations," sort of thing. Um, but apart from that, I've not not really spoke to anyone apart from the the emails, like the itinerary stuff. Um, there's not really been anything else. But I think it's still sort of dust still settling a little bit. I think. Um, and then I think there's a there's a meet up in a couple of weeks. So I'm sure, there'll be be a bit more chat then. Um, but yeah, like it's a it's a it's a it's a weird one. Like just need to get back on back on task with Gloucester still, don't we? It's still like you forget there's still well you don't forget, but there's still another four games to go, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. And how, how are your shoulders? Because they they must have started hurting a few years back when we played together at Newcastle. <laughs> and you were making <laughs> <Definitely>, my tackles. <laughs> definitely did. I was, I was thinking about this earlier today, actually, about I should remember this one moment where, where you were in a, def- a defensive set and you were just slowly like want like getting yourself out to the wing and then I was just like, <laughs> you were standing on the edge and I was like dude what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, I love how you said slowly it you. oh funny man mate, not, it used to be a sprint to get to the wing so I couldn't make any tackles but yeah uh, mate it was just no need big, big presence in the middle yeah no, no need for that so the shoulders alright you'll be back playing soon for Gloucester because obviously yeah. you know, 
with with the game at the weekend, the boys had a hell of a performance, but you were obviously rested with the shoulder. You, you all good to go? No, nah, I should should be good to go this week. Just do a little bit of contact, see that how that is. But if it's not right, obviously, like I think it'd be stupid to to force it. But um, mate, just just see how we go this week. It's a Monday night game, isn't it? So we're not in till Wednesday anyway. So there's still still a good amount of time. Yeah, and uh, the boys were class at the weekend for Gloucester. Great win. Uh, Franklin's Gardens against Northampton are a really good team as well. And your this sounds great. Your British and Irish Lions teammate, uh, Lewis Rees Zammett, was classed in that game as well. And obviously his video went a little bit viral as well uh, from him going on the tour. I mean, his, didn't his brother have a bet or something that he was going to go when he was about 12? And he's, he's, he's made, let's just say he's made a million pounds or something. He's a millionaire um, now, yeah. He's a millionaire <laughs> off the back of it. Smart call. But how good was it seeing him go? You obviously play with him. And, he, he, you know, it's difficult, like you said, to even get up for a running session. But he was class at the weekend when he played as well. Uh, he's he, he's been he's been brilliant, hasn't he? To be fair to him, um, he's one of the he's a, he's a confidence player, isn't he? And that's just boosted him up a, a little bit more. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll I'll bring him back down to earth when when we're back in on Wednesday, I reckon. But now nah, he's he's, <laughs> he's he's a good lad, and he's just he's just playing so well. And just to see him go from what what in the last twelve months when he was first on the scene, he was so raw. Um, he had so much to work on, and then honestly, after a couple of camps with Wales or whatever it was. Like you just come back like a complete different player, like like an he's like an experienced player, um, and that and that's brilliant, and it's, he's been brilliant for us. So, um, and he's still only what what is he twenty? About just. fourteen, I think. Yeah, I think he looks 14. young. It's it's, it's silly that the, the talent he's got, man. Um, but see, it's exciting to see how, how far he can go. Um, let's talk about you then, mate, because obviously over the last year, eighteen months is where you've really stepped up at international level and been sort of starting regularly um, and now you're you played that well that you're on the British and Irish Lions tour do you feel that your international rugby now is is something that you're used to and um, or do you still sort of pinch yourself every time you put on the Scotland jersey because Scotland's performances and Jim and I joke about it a lot in here but they have gone through the roof over the last year and you know you've been a huge part of that for the, the team as well um, yeah like when, like when when I first started playing for Scotland I, that's that's when I was I let the let the occasions get the better of me, I think. And I think that's like, when I, when I sort of mentioned it before, just about focusing on the task, I like just keep yourself focused on the task at hand. Like I used to let everything get to me a bit too much. And that was, that was what sort of, that was my like barrier, if you like. Um, and so once I, once I sort of got over that and I've just sort of, when I was playing, I just sort of made sure that it was, this is, this, it's not just another game, but like it's a game of rugby, do, do what you're good at. Um, you're, here, you're here because you're good at this and that to so just go and do it um, so like yes like again like after after games and stuff you're like oh that, that, was, that was class that's special like you, you let the moment get back to you after, after the game sort of thing um, so I do pinch myself after but not like during the game I've learned from previous previous games just to just to keep myself focused in, in each moment within the game and that's how I sort of get through it and that's how I get the best best out of myself and I think that's been been working for me yeah um we were chatting about young Lewis Rees at the age of 20 doing what he's doing now and obviously talking about yourself with the apprenticeship you've had at Tyndale in National One I think you're around 23 24 I think Rotherham as well did you play for Rotherham yeah, well, so I did so Tyndale was when I was still at still at uni uni um yeah I, I was at Tyndale for a couple of years and then that's where Newcastle sort of picked me up so finished finished there at 22 and then went did a, did a year with Newcastle with Gammy Shoulders. I didn't really do a lot. Then I got another year, and that's when I went to Rotherham. So I would have been what twenty three, I think. Uh, and then debuted. My prem debut was a couple of days before my twenty fourth birthday. Yeah, because uh, I think it, I think it shows, Chaz, doesn't it, that lads play in the championship. And I, I played in the championship. I played for Nottingham um, when I was a young lad. Um, it's, yeah, it's tough though, isn't it? It's a tough old league to go and play in. Not highly paid. Do you know what I mean? The opportunities are few and far between. But, you know, if you're knocking about in the lower leagues at 23, 24, it gives these other young lads or, you know, lads that are in their 20s a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, you know? I definitely. It's just, it's just not really giving up on it, is it really? Like, I think I was different because I wasn't, I wasn't signed at Rotherham, so like, I was loaned out. So it's probably a bit different, but like, like if, as long as you you work hard and I think you get that I've, I, I hang my hat on my work my work rate my work ethic and I think that's kind of what's got me there um, but Rotherham was class I really enjoyed my time there um, I only did maybe six months I think 
right up until that sort of Prem debut. And then I sort of stayed at Newcastle and I was in, I was in and out, in and out. And then, and then, and then Goody came, I think. Yeah, and I just wanted just that, that was it. There is a history. <laughs> you just said you hang your hat on your work rate and your work ethic. That, that must have been something that I taught you, was it? Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the work, the work, the work rate from the bloody dugout in the in the training weeks. <laughs> just <laughs> shouting stuff. Honestly, <laughs> man, this, this this geezer flies up. Fair play, you fly up in the morning though, and you come come to training. But poor Craig Willis, he's out there training Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then you just rock up on the Saturday and get all the glory. <laughs> with, with, his, with his Louis Vuitton handbag as well. <laughs> Louis Vuitton handbag, mate. Oh, mate, someone had to keep us up. Someone had to keep Newcastle up. And it was uh, it was good fun. It was good fun. Well, I, I, have you heard much about? You said you got the itinerary and, and a few emails. Do you know how the tour is going to work at all? Because one of the big things, and I know, I'm not going to say that you're you know just all about going out on nights out. But we had a couple of decent nights out in Newcastle. Um, part of being a, a new team, part of the Lions experience, is being able to bond and. And go out and, and have a few drinks together. Um, have you heard much about how it's going to work? Because we're hearing about bubbles and the difficulty of that. And do you have, or do you want to share with anyone and our millions of listeners? Do you have a, a kind of party piece that you can bring to the, the table for the Lions tour that you can? <laughs> I'm going to make yourself a legend. I haven't got a party piece that I can share with the uh, with the listeners. Uh, uh, you can share anything on there, mate. Oh, uh, no, nah, man. You'll have, to, <laughs> you'll have to ask someone else. I'm sure, I'm sure you, you, you've heard it before, uh, Goody, but, um, mate, I, in terms of the itinerary, I, I've not, I've not really heard much more than, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just meet up on this date and then the tour starts this day. I don't know anything else. So I presume that maybe that first date we would meet up, so a piss up, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be good, eh? I think, uh, I think uh, there will be. Yeah, but I presume that we'll we'll find out more. Um, it went in a couple of weeks. I think they'll they'll explain everything on on that day. So, um, so sorry, I haven't really got much more for you than that in terms of the itinerary. Has anyone give you a heads up of, of of potential what to expect? Obviously, Billy Twelve Trees, who we announced on this podcast a couple of years ago. Chris, I don't know if you know that he changed his name to Twelve Trees because. His surname was shy and his dad's a tree surgeon. That's a, that's a fact. I'm telling you now. Um, but he got called up in 2013. The tour arguably where I should have won. Should have went. Um, <laughs> has he give you any insight? I mean, is there, is, hey, is there anything I'm, more? I'm, I'm, I, need, I need to chat to him properly about it. So I haven't, I haven't seen him properly yet. But he's when, when it was announced, he came up to me and he was just like, he was so buzzing for me. He was like, mate, you're going to absolutely love it. Like, I'm so happy for you. It's going to be an unbelievable summer. Make sure you, make sure, he's like, make sure you enjoy it. Um, so I don't know. He went. He went in the middle, didn't he? He went mid tour, didn't he? Um, yeah. And I think. I think he, he. I think he said that he was all. He, he focused almost a bit more on the rugby as opposed to the the touring side. Do you know what I mean? Nah, nah, nah. I don't respect the man anymore. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. He, 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 he enjoys touring. He enjoys touring. But I think he. So I think there's definitely a balance that that I, I probably need to be more the other way, maybe. But. Um, Man, I'm just honestly, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see what it's about because everyone just raves about it, don't they? Like everyone, everyone raves about the tour. Um, so like, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what it's all about. And you'll be there with some familiar faces as well from the Scotland squad. And there's a lot of talk about this. Eight Scotland players, and again, not that I am the oracle. I picked 29 out of 36 or 37 man squad, and I picked seven of the Scots. I didn't realise Rory Sutherland was fit. But that's unbelievable, really, isn't it? And I think a lot of people who haven't seen Scottish rugby would be like, oh, you know, Sander Ferguson's going, for example, who I think is class. Um, like, how good is that for you that they're going? I know you're, you'll be mates with some of the England lads as well, I'm sure. But um, to get a, a large number of Scots, we've joked about it before, it's usually the kit man and the, the doctor plus one. <laughs> you know, uh, whereas now we've got a decent show and have actually some world-class players. No, I think it's... I, I think that just... It comes off the back of, of a brilliant Six Nations, isn't it? I know you said we should finish fourth, but in Goody, like the performances have been up there. So I think just off the back of that, like, ev- like everyone was holding the hand up. So, um, but like going into camp, like no- knowing a few a few faces, de- it'll definitely make it easier. Because um, I think when I went into Scotland camp for the first time, the very first time, I didn't know anybody, and that that was definitely it was a little bit more difficult to sort of get get into the group because. It was like a bulk of Glasgow boys, bulk of, bulk of Edinburgh boys, and it sort of took a little bit longer to to sort of get in, get involved, really. Um, so it's definitely it's nice it's nice knowing knowing that there's there's eight boys that 
seven, seven of the boys that, that I already know, and it would make it easier just to sort of mingle in, wouldn't it? And the Gregor Townsend, obviously, uh, running the attack, you'll know some ideas that he's had. You, you had any contact with him since the announcement? Uh, literally, literally just that. He just sent, sent a couple of messages back and forth, just saying congrats sort of thing. So, um, But no, no more than that as yet. Um, but yeah, I'm just yeah. It'll be it'll be be good to to get there and, and see what it's about. See see how see what he's like as a as a coach in, in a in a British and Irish line top. Are there any players that you've watched from afar that you're excited to play with, or that you? Yeah, I'm 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 interested to see what what Farrell's like um, around around the boys and what he's like. Because I know he's he's supposed to be really good with the rugby stuff and. I'm, I'm I'm quite interested to see what he's about and see see if I could see what I can learn learn off him. Um, All I'm saying, Chris, is keep your hands up because he throws these balls really hard. Yeah, yeah at oh. people's heads. And if you ain't got your hands up, if you ain't got your hands up, it could come off your forehead. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, man. Fair enough. I'll take, I'll take that on board. Um, just a, a few lines on Gloucester. Then, obviously, a load of changes there. As you know, as I know, phenomenal club. You know the fans and stuff that go along with it. Great group of lads. You obviously, you're now mates with my best mate, Ravo. Fifty Ravo's arm. Ravo, and he's a great boy, man. Yeah, he is, and um, good group of young lads there. Young coaching staff, and it's been tough. It's been a, it, it, being at Gloucester is tough. There's always a lot of changes, but I think now what they've got with with Skivington obviously at the helm, uh, Alex King, um, Waldock as well, just to name a few. Obviously, Alex Brown now taking more of a manager managerial role is it seems like the future actually is quite bright at the club Def, definitely is a lot as you said there's a lot of youth coming through um like like zam and and the sort of the rest the rest of his little 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 group of minions that are that are sort of starting to play a little bit more um so from that perspective it's brilliant Hasto coming in uh as, a, as another 10 option alongside alongside lloyd george barton so there's three like they're still young but they're all like young tens um, and then there's, there's obviously the few, few of the older boys. I think I'm an older boy now. Um, <laughs> just, 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 just goes like that, doesn't it? Um, but yeah, like, and, and the coaches are all, all young as well, and like they're still keen, keen to learn. And like, it's, it's, it's very much sort of one group. And I think that's, I think that's, that's brilliant. What I've was wasn't used to um, being up, being up at Newcastle. It wasn't quite like that as much as, much as I love Newcastle, but it was. It's very, very. Everyone's very sort of approachable and, and keen, keen to learn new ideas off each other. And, and uh, it's uh, we, we were getting there. We were building and building, and we were sort of we were only we were a couple of result, results off, off off win, a couple of points off of getting another couple of wins. So uh, like like the, the potential is there. And as you see as you've seen on the on the weekend against Northampton, like that was just a brilliant performance. Yeah, yeah. You can say oh Northampton didn't turn up, but I think the fact that what what we turned up with kind of kept them quiet, didn't it? Because I, I was I was wait, I was waiting for Northampton just to, to come back into it, but we held we held pretty strong, which is which is just good to see. All right, Chris. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, mate, and massive congratulations. Hey, no Best of luck in South Africa. Thank you very much. Cheers, fellas. Top, Top lad. lad. Yeah. It is. Oh, oh, he really is. Tell me, is it is it what it says on the tin? Party, peace. That's, that's what I'm saying, mate. My well, goodness. You don't say anything more. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, the old hot water bottle, the old microphone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, lovely bloke. Yeah, lovely bloke. Good hair, uh, good looking boy. He, he is quite shy, actually. Um, you know, when I first went up to Newcastle, I was like, fucking hell, I don't think he likes me, um, which I got quite a lot with people, but in reality, not at Newcastle. Um, but he was just quiet. And then we got to know each other really well, a few good nights out in Newcastle. Um, and yeah, you, you actually look back at his story and people just see the selection, Chris Harris, Scotland. But like you said to him then, Jim, Tyndale, Rotherham, then Newcastle, back to Newcastle. You know, he's gone through and grafted to get to, you know, his move to Gloucester once Newcastle got relegated. And, you know, fair play to him. You know, you hear what he's saying there around, you know, he gets carried, he used to get carried away and you know, he just focuses on the short-term goals. And that's got him to be a British and Irish Lion. That is phenomenal. Uh, I'm dead chuffed for him. He's a lovely bloke. Um, you yeah, know, he works ridiculously hard. And, uh, yeah, I think he's going to have a banging time. Um, just make sure he gets his hands up to catch Farrell fast because Jim didn't and he never spoke to you again, did he? That was sim simple as that. Simple <laughs> as that. I love how we judge a man on his party piece. Peace, yeah. Well, um, let's move on to what went down at the stoop, shall we, Goody? Yeah, I mean, what an unbelievable game. In terms of attacking rugby, um, it was basically Marcus Smith against Dan Robson. Um, and it was, a you know, 
obviously I wanted Ross to win, of course I did. But for anyone watching that game, how you can not be excited watching it is beyond me. It was the skill levels on show, you know, defence was optional at times for, for both teams, but some of the tries were unbelievable. The intensity, um, just the pace. That, like, oh, Jim, we'd have been blown out our hoops after about five minutes. In those days. <laughs> the game has changed so much, hasn't it? Well, it looked hot. And you mentioned Dan Robson, who I thought was phenomenal. He genuinely looked like he had some strike. I don't know whether it's how long he's been bowled for and how long he's had no air for. I think it's been a while. But he was looking hot and out of breath. And I was thinking, if he's looking hot and out of breath, most of us would struggle. But I agree. But I thought it was a proper game. And obviously, yeah. there's talking points in that. The red card. I thought Wasta going to run away with it, Andrew. Yeah, I really so did. But fair play switched to Quinn. Def- yeah, we switched yeah. off defensively. Fair oh, play to Quinn and the Nick Evans. Um, you know, it shows... Again, we spoke about it earlier in the season with Gustard and the cultural issues there. You know, you look at the makeup of that, having someone like Nick Evans in charge and obviously Adam Jones. Um, they've got a bit of backbone, mate. To go down to 40 men with Mike Brown's red card, fair play to them. Because I thought Wasps looked all over them at, at, from large parts of that game. Yeah, they did. And, uh, you know, the red card, Wasps, you know, it was a big turnaround because Quinns went the length and, and scored it. It got pulled back for Mike Brown's stamp on uh, Tommy Taylor, which, you know, and I, I sit there and I go, you know, is it unfortunate? You know, was Tommy holding him? Doesn't matter. It's red mist. He's yeah. had the red mist there. That's it. Yeah. Full stop. It's, yeah. it's pointless oh. trying to, try to, look, it's That's pointless deliberate. saying, what, I, what, what, well, what only he knows. I've, I've probably, yeah, well, I'd probably, I'll probably say, I don't believe Mike Brown would have thought to deliberately stamp on his head, but he is, I think he's deliberately trying to stamp on him somewhere. You know, put his boot on him somewhere, and it's unfortunate it's gone on his head and his eye, and it's really dangerous. You know, he could have lost his sight in his eye, to be fair. But yeah, I mean, anyone that's now saying, you know, you just hope they go soft on him so he can get a, 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 a Quinn's farewell, it's just, it's just crazy. You know, it's a stamp, it's land on his head, it's ridiculously reckless. Do I think he deliberately tried to stamp on his head? No. Do I think he deliberately tried to stamp on him because the red mist came out? Yes. So therefore, you have to accept the consequences. And, um, you know, I think. A long band's probably coming for it. But, you know, Wasps should have. They had an eight-point lead. They should have cleaned out Quinns at that point, but switched off defensively a few times, gave a couple of dumb penalties away, which allowed Quinns some territory. And then Marcus Smith, you know, what a world he ever plays. Won their last two games for Harlequins. And you talk about big moments and small moments. He's won Harlequins' last two games after the buzzer with a try himself. Um, you know, Is he the best 10 in the country? Uh, at the minute, he probably is, yeah. Um, although, having said that, George Ford played exceptionally well on the front foot for Leicester last week, uh, Ulster, didn't he? So, but yeah, Marcus Smith, you hope he's going to play for England in the summer now. Here's your opportunity. We don't need to play George Ford against USA in the two test matches. Um, just give Marcus Smith the range because you know he's so exciting. He's He's got game management, he's got a box of tricks that for me, no other player apart from maybe Cipriani and his pomp has probably had in the Premiership over the last however many years. Um, and he is managing that Harlequins team into the top four and, and who knows for him, really, because he is producing magic week in, week out. Well, we spoke to Chris Harris briefly about it, but Gloucester going to Northampton and winning 31-7 was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Yes, it was. A comfortable, comfortable win. Gloucester looked really good. It's been coming, like Chris said. like They've, they've narrowly lost a few games this season and it's been frustrating if you're a Gloucester fan to watch them and obviously I've got a few mates there my best mate Ray arm is the team manager you know Alex Brown we both speak about George Givington in high regard but the results haven't been there for Gloucester up there especially in the early part of the season but I know Northampton had a week off but physically physically Gloucester looked brilliant they yeah. you, you know the way that they carried um, the way that they led with L- Lewis Ludlow Little Chief um, the physicality, Route 1, Lewis Rees Samet turning up, having just got big news, he could have Wheels. just... Ridiculous. Um, so for me, it has been coming. I did not think... I didn't think they were going to win at, at Northampton because the way that Northampton were playing, but they, they were passing... Dominated set piece as well, didn't they? Yeah. So, and, you know, George Skiverton has brought that in, similar to Borthwick at Leicester. That's the kind of foundation. Ed Slate is huge for Gloucester. Yeah. Huge. How much for loss was bigger when he went off? Huge, because he's, he's your 10, your talisman, your game controller. And Furbank goes to 10, um, uh, who's an exciting talent, but he's not a game controller like bigger. But you just got to tip the slipper to Gloucester, really, haven't you? Because, you know, while everyone's like, oh, Northampton, they didn't turn up. This, that, 
Gloucester didn't allow them to turn up. They dominated them at set piece. Their kicking game was better than Northampton's. And yes, you know, you can go in and talk about Furbank uh, and the, the game control. They didn't have their first choice halfbacks out there and it does make a big difference. But yeah, tip the slip to Gloucester Saints fans. And what I loved was Chris Boyd, his, uh, his explanation of the game. He said, oh, in England, you take your dog for a walk, you carry a plastic bag and you put some stuff in it. We had a big bag of whatever's the stuff in it. Basically, he's saying they were absolute dog shit um, and they, had a, they were basically a big bag of dog shit, uh, which I quite liked, really. Um, and the Saints, it's really frustrating for them because you're thinking they should possibly win that home game against Gloucester to put pressure on Quinns, um, you know, for their game on Sunday against Wasps. They lose, so that releases a bit of pressure on Quinns, who are worth four points ahead of them. And then Quinns go and win it at the death and get a five-point victory over over Wasps. And the gap's down nine points, which, you know, with four games left, I think the top four is probably done and dusted now. And, and that is a big slip-up for Northampton. Bristol secured their spot as well with a big win against Bath. Silly good, Bristol are. Um, you know, they, they were 15 nil down as well, Bristol were. Uh, a, a bit of opportunism from Bath. Um, and it's their biggest ever win at the wreck as a club from their nearest and dearest rivals. So yeah, just their whole, the way they play, Malins, how good is he? Like, all I'm thinking, every, every time I see him now, all I'm thinking is Jim says he's got an absolute dad bod. Yeah, he, gli- <laughs> he glides, doesn't he? And he, and he, you know, he makes breaks. Piertel was a worldie. He's got a dad bod with no kids. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, they were dominated set piece. Obviously, Sinclair got man of the match played exceptionally well. Um, you know, they were powerful. It, 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 the list goes on. They they were back to their best. They've been schooled. You know, they got schooled by Exeter a little bit um, a couple of weeks ago, which I, I remember saying Pat Lamb wouldn't have minded it because they had the, the comfort of being at the top. And it also was a bit of a wake-up call. But they go down to, to Bath and, and just dominated them, didn't they, really? And uh, it was a comfortable all-court victory. Um, you know, they can play the razzmatazz, they can do the, the nitty gritty hard stuff, dominated the, the breakdown as well with some counter rucking. But one of the things I've got an issue with counter rucking, and you always see it, Jim, and you'll be a complete nose around this. So there's a lot of times Bristol are counter rucking and going through over the ball off their feet. Yeah. And then a Bath player comes in and ends up off his feet, seeing off, and the penalty goes against, yeah, penalty goes against Bath. Surely if you're counter rucking, you've got to stay on your feet, right? Yeah, there's not many of us that can do it where you can go in at such a low level at really high speed and basically hold your feet. It's a really difficult skill to do. So it's, uh, again, it's one of the things, unless the referees talk about it before and they pick it up. But yes, it is difficult to counter up and not be on your hands, Andrew. That is yeah. why um, there's not many people that can do it. But yeah, I agree with you. But anyway, the nuances of the game, the, the millions of listeners probably want to hear it at a live show, probably not that. And just looking at the table with the top eight now qualifying for the Champions Cup, even Newcastle that are on 35 points could overtake Leicester, who are on eight, who are in eighth on 38 points. So anyone could get in, really, couldn't they? You've got to say, though, the standard of rugby in the Prem this season, and we can say there's no fans. Anyway, talking of fans, fans back in the stadium from Monday. How good is that going to be? There we go. You can hug people, but don't hug them, but eat out, but do eat out, but don't. Um, but the <laughs> standard so of rugby, I know, but the standard of rugby in the Prem has been brilliant, exceptional. Yeah. And, and everyone, anyone we've spoken to or had on, uh, or you listen to on BT Sports, say, like every game, we'll look at Northampton Gloucester, for example, look at Newcastle putting 50 points on um, on London Irish. So, I'll tell you about the, the, yeah, mate, I don't know, while we're talking about Falcons, and while we're talking about the Falcons, anyone listen to this, do yourself a favour. And as Jim's talking about watching and talking about the quality of it, have a look at the highlights of Newcastle against Irish. The ball skills of some of the forwards. I used to play with donkeys like you, Jim, who couldn't catch, couldn't pass, just went to but get a the rock to the cow sheds and back. <laughs> exactly. Drive them all and kick someone in the head and play on. Um, mate, the ball skills of forwards now are just a different breed, aren't they? You watch some of the ball handling and the way Newcastle played in the second half. I think Irish were 15 14 up at half time. And then Newcastle go on to literally pull their pants down and put 50 points on them. It was phenomenal. And just seeing the speed, the, you know, the skill level, Newcastle were, were, were outstanding. And that top eight battle was going to be interesting because I suppose with, with Leicester, they've got kind of a double shot at it. They've got the Champions Cup. If they win the final of that, they'll definitely qualify um, as one of the eight. But also their last game of the season with fans, 
at the Rico Arena, Wasps against Leicester, that could be the one that decides who goes into the top eight and who doesn't. So who knows? Lots of ruggers to go. I think London Irish are on a kind of slippery slope out of the top eight, potentially. Um, and, you know, let's just hope that potentially Wasps and Leicester finish in the top eight and they get Champions Cup rugby next year. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Patricia Timmer. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. And head on over to Spotify, and we'll see you there. Regulate Rugby Pod. Spotted pod, 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 pod.